Um, heat induces autophagy and has been proven to do it. Mild heat stress has been shown to induce autophagy in, in various single cell organisms. And so some suggestions for heat, sauna and steam rooms, hot yoga, outdoor activities and warmer hot weather. It's going to be nice and warm in Columbus today. So one of my afternoon things will probably wait till the heat gets the highest. And I'm going to go for a nice run down to the river fresh air, sunshine, produce some vitamin D. This is all good for promoting health in general and autophagy specifically. Um, acupuncture can be effective, uh, not by itself, but as an adjuvant treatment. It's been shown to promote autophagy and restore mitochondrial and lysosome structure in mice with Parkinson's disease, for example. Um, Diet, just and, and not not this eating within a window crap, and certainly not a ketogenic diet. But um, believe it or not, coffee has shown to has been shown to induce autophagy, um, and and it may be one of the reasons why epidemiological studies and clinical trials show that coffee is actually associated with better health. Um, I had one of my um, uh, colleagues look into this, and and she wrote a long, 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 long paper. And, um, and the research is very clear on coffee. You've got a tiny percentage of the population that is caffeine sensitive and shouldn't have it, right? That's, that's uh, and, and certainly you shouldn't take up the coffee drinking habit if you don't like it. But for most people, it's actually beneficial. And believe it or not, the sweet spot for disease, if it contributes at all to disease prevention, seems to be three to four cups a day. So no reason to give it up uh, if you like it. No reason to add it if you don't. But, but the point is, coffee's been villainized for reasons that I don't entirely understand. Um, at EGCG, we talked about yesterday, a polyphenol in green tea has been shown to increase autophagy and to induce lipid clearance in mice fed a high fat Western diet. So the point is not to eat high fat and uh, drink green tea. The point is to marshal all of the possible strategies toward optimal health that you can. All right. Um, and it's also been shown to increase autophagy in human cell lines. Uh, low sodium levels are common in COVID-19 patients. And, um, and this is kind of an interesting thing to talk about because along with coffee, sodium seems to be on the hit list of things to villainize these days. And we do have taste receptors for sodium, for salt on our tongue, which should tell us something. And, um, and it's a necessary, uh, necessary nutrient. Uh, a study of 132 hospitalized patients between um, uh, 51, eight, 50, eight, mean age 51, uh, hyponatremia was found in 84 patients. That's a pretty high percentage. Patients with COVID-19 disease had 2.15 times higher odds of suffering from hyponatremia. And uh, several studies have reported the link between hyponatremia and hospital admission with COVID and transfer to ICU, use of ventilation or death. And so I'm very concerned about this uh, new trend toward um, restricting all added salt to the diet. Uh, I have had, I had a friend who spent three days in an ICU long before COVID strictly because of, he had depleted his salt stores so much between restricting salt and sweating and hot yoga and, and other uh, athletic endeavors that he ended up hospitalized. And so, um, you know, most people reduce their salt when they stop eating so much processed garbage and less animal food and increasing whole plant food. There's no further restriction needed. There's another issue, and, and someday maybe I'll do a whole lecture on salt in this, in this uh, for this conference, but there's another issue which has to do with the ratio between um, uh, sodium and potassium. And um, uh, the, the bottom line is that if you upset that ratio, you end up with health issues. So when you eat a health promoting diet, your sodium levels are lower, your potassium intake is higher and everything's just swell. You start some extremism on either side and you can mess things up pretty well. So some causes of hyponatremia are medications um, in particular uh, can do it. Diuretics are famous for it, antidepressants and pain medications, vomiting and diarrhea, drinking too much water. Um, and, and that's, you can kill yourself with too much water, too much of a good thing. You have to look at that sometimes too. Um, a very famous episode was a woman who died running the Boston Marathon um, because she drank too much water. She actually gained weight running the marathon. And by the time she was far from the finish line. She had put on weight. She had drank too, drunk too much water. 
and her sodium levels were dangerously low, and then restricting salt intake for a period of time. The other thing is drinking reverse osmosis and distilled water, which will eventually wash out all your electrolyte stores. So um, not a bad idea to drink distilled water for a water fast or something of that nature. Not a great idea at all to consume uh, distilled or reverse osmosis water on an ongoing basis. Sooner or later, you'll have problems. Um, I found a couple of case reports that I thought were interesting, mainly because the solution is so low tech and low cost, it might be worth looking into for some people. And that is the use of just plain everyday antihistamines. Um, and, and then of course, there are other things that you could do that serve the same purpose, but, but and I'll get to that in a minute. So here's the first one, a female in her forties, normal weight, had acute COVID symptoms for 24 days, which is a long time. That is a red flag right there. Um, partial resolution, but she had persistent rashes, red flank pain, bilateral chest pain, right-sided headache, her hair fell out, uh, bruising, oral ulcerations, fatigue, and brain fog. Um, her lab tests and ultrasound were all normal. Um, so what happened, it was an accidental finding. She ate some cheese that she turned out to be allergic to, and she took some Benadryl, 50 milligrams, and the next day, she was able to concentrate, her fatigue was better. After 72 hours, her symptoms returned. So she took Benadryl again and eventually got a prescription antihistamine and um, nearly complete resolution of exercise intolerance, chest pain, brain and uh, brain fog and fatigue resulted. She also had decreases in headache, rashes, bruises and oral ulcerations. We was able to return to work exercising one to two hours a day. And so um, you could accomplish the same thing with drinking filtered water water, salting your food, um, and eating a health-promoting diet, but the taking of the antihistamines while you're fixing all of the things that need to be resolved um, would certainly not be a bad idea. I don't like lifetime prescription of uh, antihistamines, but as, um, as a uh, transition to healthier living, that could work well. Here's another one, uh, middle-aged female teacher, normal weight as, but did have asthma and seasonal allergies. So again, this would be an example of the pre-existing conditions that lead to this. Sick with COVID for three months, all right, so pre-existing conditions, you get sicker for longer, develop tachycardia, post-exertion fatigue, joint pain, insomnia, you know, a whole um, uh, intermittent taste and smell uh, disorders, difficulty concentrating. This went on for nine months and some of it got worse and she developed abdominal pain and bloating. So remember, with the, if you listened to yesterday, we we're talking about probiotics and the role of restoring the gut microbiome, um, both to prevent and treat COVID-19. Um, she also took a, a, an antihistamine and the next morning the brain fog and fatigue resolved and she continued to take it and a lot of other things got better and she's now 95% of pre illness function. Um, again, using the, um, uh, the antihistamines as a bridge while you're fixing the other things because clearly this woman was sick before she got COVID. She had asthma and seasonal allergies, neither of which are in normal state of good health, right? Um, another thing uh, that is an interesting solution is halotherapy, the use of salt vapor to relieve symptoms of many conditions, including respiratory disorders. It's not new because it goes back to Hippocrates, use salt to treat respiratory conditions. And again, it's baffling to me how salt became so vilified. It's, it, it's it just baffling. Um, 1843, a physician observed that Polish salt miners didn't seem to get respiratory disorders. Uh, during World War II, Dr. Carl Spanigal reported that his patients improved while hiding in salt caves in Germany to protect themselves from aggressive bombing. And uh, those hiding in the caves said, gosh, I, I, my coughing went away, my breathing got better. The Russians actually developed the first technology that would allow the duplication of salt caves outside of the salt cave, actually going into a salt room. An article in a 1902 issue of The Lancet advocated the use of salt for the treatment of upper respiratory conditions. And a 2009 survey of family practice doctors showed that 87% of them had recommended salt treatment for one or more conditions, and we certainly recommend it. Salt caves have been used in Eastern Europe for a very long time. It's um, 
actually referred to as speleotherapy. And so it's just the recreation of a salt cave for therapeutic purposes. Um, if you go to the, almost every major city has one. There's one uh, very close to my office that's uh, owned by a client of mine. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It's I like going there just because it's a beautiful place. But um, the rooms are warm and slightly humid. And then dry sodium chloride particles are infused into the air into a really clean room. Uh, it's been shown to help patients with breathing problems and uh, also patients with asthma, infectious disease and inflammatory conditions. I've been sending people to salt rooms for years and years and years. And when they started becoming a thing around the country, uh, I visited one a few times just to see what it was like. I'm, I'm reluctant to send people to do something I haven't checked out myself. And, um, and what happened was kind of interesting. Um, I visited the, the salt cave because I wanted to see what it was all about. I didn't have anything wrong with me that I knew about, so I didn't expect anything to get better. But what did happen, and it was just an incidental thing, is I noticed that my sense of smell got better. This was years ago, like 10 years ago, eight years ago. And so obviously with one of the main problems with long COVID being the um, loss of, of uh, smell, um, I would recommend at least trying this. It's not expensive and there's nothing that can go wrong with it. A study of 193 patients and matched controls with respiratory disease, significant improvement in symptoms with the use of dry aerosol over placebo in mild and moderate cases, 75% in severe cases, 97% in uh, chronic bronchitis. So again, not much can go wrong. The best, of the, you'll, you'll come out feeling nice and relaxed. For me, it was like having a mid-afternoon nap, which I never get time to do. Mm -hmm.